And I think the big focus for number 10 is making sure we do everything possible to reduce the potential bloodletting at that on May the 2nd because uh, it, at, at the moment it looks like the results are going to be really dire and that I think will be the moment of maximum vulnerability for the Prime Minister. Let's, let's start off with this, the strange Westminster sexting scandal. A, a second Conservative MP has now revealed he was targeted. Um, before we talk about exactly where this is all going, just fill us in on, on the latest stuff we've learned. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously this story has been developing throughout the week as we've learned more and more people falling victim to this spear phishing attack. The latest is that Luke Evans, who is the MP for Market Bosworth and Hinckley, actually my parents' local MP, uh, he was sent messages about a month ago. Uh, relate, uh, and these messages were sent from an unknown number to him, um, uh, a, somebody posing as a, an attractive-looking woman, and she sent through a series of, of messages pretending to know Luke Hall before sending through what's known as a view once photo. Uh, and for novices of WhatsApp, that's basically a photo you can't see until you click on the photo itself. And then when the photo comes up, um, it's, it, you can't kind of screenshot it and it goes away straight away. But anyway, Luke Evans clicked on this photo and, and it turned out to be a naked woman. So immediately alarm bells rang with him and he didn't engage forever from what I can tell. He then contacted the police and alerted the Conservative Party's chief whip, Simon Hart. But then a few days later, uh, he was approached again by uh, the same person and sent a series of further explicit messages. Uh, and so he then recorded those and then sent them to the police. But he's the first MP who has voluntarily um, publicly outed themselves, presumably because mm. he feels he's done nothing wrong. And he's also just, I, I think he was concerned that there was so much noise around about which potential MPs had been targeted that he felt sure. he needed to get his name out there. Do we? So, I mean, the the, the position of, of William Ragg seems seems troubling because although, look, he's obviously had an extremely bad time, was quite frightened by what he was uh, subjected to, seems to have been sort of uh, something pretty close to blackmail. He, I mean, he does, in as much as I understand the story, he does seem to be the reason why other MPs were targeted because he passed on their numbers, which you'd think ought to be some kind of disciplinary offence within the party or indeed Parliament itself. I think it's very, very difficult at this stage to see how Will Ragg remains as an MP. Now, he's already announced he's going to be stepping down at the next election, but um, look, he, from what I can understand, he's obviously very shaken at the moment and... Um, understandably so but and and lots of people have spoken out in support of Will Ragg they said he's done the right thing by by admitting what he did um and obviously you can you can try and sympathize with with him and his position okay he'd sent through um some would say stupidly he sent compromising pictures of himself to somebody he'd met on a dating website and then he feared that they would then use those pictures expose mm -hmm. him and but they they use those to uh, to to collect the personal phone numbers of various people and we should we should remind ourselves it's not just MPs who've been targeted here it's also journalists who work in Westminster and it's also a number of political officials and at the moment the current tally is about 17 people i imagine there are probably dozens who are actually involved in this in total so so some people have been very sympathetic towards Bill Ragg, but the reality is, can you, as a legislator in our parliament, have been given given the warnings, even the kind of warnings that we give to children about not, not engaging in this kind of conduct and don't send compromising pictures, can we really have a legislator who is so susceptible to these techniques? And also the very act, as you said, of passing on the numbers, knowing that those people would then be susceptible to blackmail that's a very concerning thing. And unfortunately for Will Ragg, he's, some, he's somebody I've known for a long time. I do have sympathy for him, but I think he has some very, very serious questions to answer. Yeah. I mean, I assume there's no definitive answer here. Otherwise, it would, be, it would already be public. But is there any indication of who might have been doing the targeting here? Whether we're talking about a, a blackmailer, whether we're talking about some kind of prankster, whether we might even be talking about another uh, state actor, anything like that? Well, that's what's so intriguing about all of this is the reality is we don't know. There is a suggestion in today's times that uh, this number that was used, there were two numbers, in fact, because there were two people uh, purporting to be called Charlie and Abby, and they also changed genders depending on the sexual orientation of the person they were targeting. But um, we don't know. There's a suggestion that the number was connected potentially to previous romance frauds. So maybe this is an organised crime group or maybe this is a, an, an individual who's defrauded people in the past. But I have to say, um, I know at least five of the people who have been involved in, in these personally, and um, I know quite a lot of the details. I have to say, 
the 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 approaches and the sophistication of of the approaches are very concerning. These people that were being targeted, the the assailants, they had a lot of personal information about the individuals they targeted. And one of the concerns, and it is being dismissed at the moment, is at a time when we have a very sense in, uh, heightened sense uh, of concern about MPs and foreign um, state interference in our democracy, whether this actually is some sort of either proxy or a direct attack by maybe a foreign intelligence network. But yeah. there is no evidence at the moment. Scotland Yard is currently coordinating a series of investigations being carried out by police forces across the country. And I imagine over the next couple of weeks, the picture will become a lot clearer. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I mean, in general terms, I suppose it would be fair to expect that there'll be more on this story in the Sunday Times tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. But as you'll imagine, Hugo, I've got to... Uh, I can't tell you too much about that other than um, there will be some very um, revealing... Um, information coming to light in the paper tomorrow. Wow. Well, yeah. I mean, good, good luck in writing that as soon as we as soon as we, we stop speaking as well. Um, look uh, <clears throat> on sort of a, a broader politics. Polls this week suggested that the Conservatives are on course for a bigger defeat than the one suffered by John Major in 1997. Uh, Labour would have uh, over 400 seats. Jeremy Hunt could lose his seat, among others. Lord Frost, the Tory peer, says there would only be smoking rubble left. Is this uh, reverberating around Westminster or was it kind of already a given? I think it's the latter, I have to say, because a few days before this poll was published, the Times uh, first reported it, uh, showing 210 Conservative losses potentially and 11 cabinet ministers potentially losing their seats. We had actually published in the Sunday Times of the weekend before another MRP poll which suggested the results were even worse than that and the Tories could be reduced to a rump of less than 100 seats. So I think the reality is every time one of these polls comes out, there's a, there's a couple of hours in the morning of, of utter panic in the WhatsApp groups among Tory MPs. But, but when you get to speak to some of the more sensible types who've been around for a while, the reality is that for the last three months or so, Hugo, the, the fatalism among Conservative MPs has well and truly set in. I haven't spoken to anybody for about I, I, I've lost count, um, but probably three or four months, as I say, um, who actually thinks the Conservatives can turn this around. Most of them are expecting heavy losses, hundreds of seats to be lost. And, and none of them, none of them can see a way out of this. Now, in terms of what's going on in Downing Street, there is a sense that whilst uh, the staffers around Rishi Sunak for, for months have been trying to ignore that and just get on with the job, get on with delivery and, and hoping just hoping that something will, will turn good and they'll be able to turn a corner. The reality is that I know, having spoken to a few of those people, that despondency is starting to set in there too. And I think the Prime Minister himself, I mean, there's lots of reports around. I don't know the veracity of them about him being increasingly tetchy behind the scenes in Downing Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's denied by his staff, but of course it would be. Um, and so what's coming now, we've got a month, well, less than a month until the local elections. And I think the big focus for number 10 is making sure they do everything possible to reduce the potential bloodletting at that on May the 2nd because uh, it, at, at the moment it looks like the results are going to be really dire and that I think will be the moment of maximum vulnerability for the Prime Minister. And in particular, the Conservative Party is worried about two of the mayoral elections that are taking place, which is in the West Midlands with Andy Street and Tees Valley for Ben Houchin. And they're very concerned that if they lose both of those mayoralties, that could be the cur that could be curtains, and that could mm -hmm. be the moment when <clears throat> lots of MPs who've resisted calling for the prime minister to go because they think it would be madness. They just they would see no other alternative because they we they would be facing wipeout at the election. That's the moment of maximum danger. So they're doing everything they possibly can to try and win those two mayoralties back, and also try and reduce the number of losses on May the second. How does this play into when the general election might be? Is there? A, I mean, if the if if the if the um the local elections and the mayoral elections are not as terrible as many expect do you think that would make rishi sunak inclined to go to the country a bit sooner or is it is it just a much more much more four-dimensional chess than that i uh, yeah I, I think it's four-dimensional honestly i I've, I've given up trying to work out when they will do it i mean the 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 smart money is still on the autumn the kind of october november time uh, but i say but in the last few few days, I've been having chats with a few people, and I do get the sense that, look, if he if he does better than expected in May, you could argue there's um there's maybe an imperative and an incentive there to go a bit earlier, maybe June, July, 
Uh, but to be honest, if the results are really, really bad on May the 2nd, um, and MP start agitating for his removal, then at that point he may then decide to go early then as well because otherwise mm. he faces being ousted in the leadership contest. Yeah. So it's really impossible. I think uh, over the last couple of weeks, the chances, the prospect of a, a slightly earlier summer election have increased somewhat. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's, um, let's talk about Gaza while I've got you. Uh, the, the US position uh, has changed. The US is, is now calling for an immediate ceasefire. There is a lot of pressure being leveled around uh, whether Britain should still be licensing sales of weapons to Israel because we do a small amount. Uh, Boris Johnson has written saying it would be madness to stop doing that, but there is, of course, pressure in the other direction too. What are you hearing about this? What's the government thinking? What's likely to happen? I think the reality is that there's been a huge amount of pressure applied this week. There's uh, The front pages have been dominated by stories about what the legal advice that the government's receiving says about arms exports and whether Israel um, is, is in compliance with international humanitarian law. Now, all of this is being brought to the fore because earlier in the week, we obviously had that terrible news that an aid convoy carrying free Britons um, and a number of other Europeans and an American and a Canadian was struck and they were killed. So obviously that has, has brought this to a domestic uh, audience uh, in a way that unfortunately all the, 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 the death and destruction of the last few months hasn't. So the, the reality is I, I, the, the legal advice is still unclear um, and I think the, the advice that the government does have in front of it it does not. It doesn't have up to date advice, which takes into account what's happened in the last few weeks. So, right now, it seems that the government's position is unchanged. And even if it, if the advice was to change and to say, well, Israel is now in breach, we have to remember that this advice doesn't compel the government to do anything. It's advisory. So, mm -hmm. and as as one minister was saying to me actually earlier this week, they said, the only time that anything's proven to be illegal is when you go to a court and a judge decides. So, you know that that it's inherently political. Any decision that will be made on this. What people say in private is that even if we were to cut off arms exports, as you said earlier, we only the total number of exports, military imports, sorry, that Israel takes from us is only 0.02% of its entire inventory that it receives from around the world. So we actually have very limited leverage here. Um, if we threatened to cut off arms exports, it would have no impact whatsoever on the conflict in Gaza. The big question is what the Americans will do, because the Americans provide up to $4 billion of military aid every year to the Israelis. And in the past, American presidents have successfully used that as leverage to make the Israelis change course. But the reality is we probably don't have that many cards to play. And I think what Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, is trying to do right now is working with the Americans. The Americans are taking a stronger line than we are on the ceasefire issue. We're still using the language of a immediate humanitarian pause and a long-term ceasefire. What we are trying to do as a country is we're trying to pressure Netanyahu to let more aid into Gaza to try and resolve some of the issues that we've been reading about, the terrible famine that's happening, the, the, the fact that people can't get food in Gaza. So that is the immediate priority of the UK government at the moment. Uh, very briefly, would it be fair to, 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 to read that there is a little bit of tension in government, that David Cameron would like us to go further and Rishi Sunak is kind of holding that back? Or, or would you not go that far? There's certainly been reports to suggest that, but I have been told that those reports, there's been quite strong pushback against that. I think right. it's certainly true that at the beginning of this conflict... Um, as Israel was starting to launch quite indiscriminate attacks in Gaza, David Cameron was certainly pushing, pushing mm -hmm. hard for a stronger response from number 10. He was certainly calling for number 10 to take action faster, whether or not he was pushing them to a, a kind of firmer position or not is debatable. But I think in more recent weeks, actually, the Prime Minister and him have had lots of discussions about this, and I think their, their position is pretty well aligned. Right. Um, but that said, if the advice changes and Cameron was of the view that we needed to cut off arms exports, I do think at that point then there may be some tensions because hmm. I think the likes of um, Kemi Badenoch, who would be involved in these decisions as a business and trade secretary, she is very pro-Israel. Um, and there are a number of cab cabinet ministers, I think, who would also be quite reluctant to go down that path. So I think for now, some of that might be slightly overstated, yeah. but we'll have to wait and see how it progresses.